Okay. Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wherever you're located, I know we have colleagues from different parts of the globe. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are located in. Um, I'm Dr. Nariman Hashamu, and I'm the founder and the CEO of the Center for Learning Innovations and Customized Knowledge Solution. But as would, many would know us as clicks, uh, it's shorter, sweeter, and easier to remember. I'm delighted to welcome you all to our first panel of the In Conversation with Clicks series of virtual panels that we are organizing today's panel under the theme leading through COVID-19 challenges, opportunities and lessons learned uh, that will be chaired by my dear friend and my dear colleague, uh, Professor Yusra uh, Muzuri, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Moscow University in Oman, and that would evolve for eminent speakers and panelists uh, that will share their insights and their experience, and that would be introduced later on by my colleague who will share the session. Uh, the aim of starting this series of uh, a panel discussion is really uh, to share insights and experiences among leaders of higher education. We are hoping to really provide in-depth discussion and insights about planning the future of the higher education sector while capitalizing on what has happened during this COVID-19. I think that we've We've had a lot of bruises, lots of lessons learned, but there's also lots of opportunities that would opening that would open up. We uh, we are hoping also to be able to share experiences uh, and basically, you know, uh, learn from another. I think there isn't there hasn't been a time where there has been so much collaboration between the sector and across different sectors in terms of sharing know-how and sharing experiences, and that's probably one of the positive things that we're going out with the pandemic from. Uh, we're delighted. We are expecting to have uh, more than 250 colleagues, hopefully, from 44 countries, including the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Ger uh, Egypt, Lebanon, South Africa, Croatia, Australia, uh, France, and many other countries. Um, obviously, we're hoping to the best we can to have an interactive panel. So we will be uh, welcoming uh, uh, the participants to ask questions using the question and answers. Uh, feature, uh, just please try to make the questions to the point and short so that we can take as many questions as possible. Uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for this series of panel discussion, uh, AUF Moyen-Orient. Uh, uh, and uh, without further ado, before handing over to my colleague, the chair of our panel today, I would like to give the floor to uh, Mr. Hervé Sabourin, Director General or Director Regional of the Association of French-Speaking Universities, AUF, to say a couple of words. Thank you very much, and I hand over to you, Mr. Sabourin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nariman. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to everyone. As the regional director of the AUF Middle East Office, I am very pleased to open the first of a new virtual panel service organized by CLICS, Center for Learning Innovations and Customized Knowledge Solutions, and sponsored by AUF, Agence Universitaire de la Francophonie. The aim of that panel is to share opinions and visions about the challenges, opportunities, and lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis. The period we are facing, that we are facing nowadays, and that we will probably face during the next months, has deeply impacted the whole university system. We can no longer teach as before. We can no longer manage institution as before. And we need to shape research activities, strategies, and targets in the light of that particular situation. Digital technologies, online teaching and working have been implemented worldwide, requiring at the same time new skills and new competencies for staff, for teachers, and for students. Many challenges are now in front of us with a key question, how to take advantage of that period in order to find sustainable solutions for ensuring the continuity of university missions. So your opinion and your propositions will be definitely very helpful. For many years, AUF has been strongly committed to supporting its member institutions 
in the necessary transition to new visions and new practices and how to enhance the capacity of learners to access, to assess, to adopt, and to apply knowledge using mainly distance learning and digital technologies. That commitment makes all the more sense today. And that's why our agency is so pleased to take part in the, the, that new CLICS initiative, bringing the experience of expertise of its network of around 1,000 higher education institutions in 118 countries spread over all continents. My woeful thanks to CLICS to its uh, CEO, Dr. Nariman Ajhamu, and all her team for our very efficient collaboration. Thanks a lot to all participants for sharing a part of the time with us. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much. I will stop, no French. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Sabourin. And I would like in my turn to thank uh, our chair and our panelists. And without any further ado, I will hand over to my friend and my colleague, Professor Yustra, to chair this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anariman, and uh, thank you to all the panelists as well as uh, the participants who have made today possible. Uh, I'm delighted, I really am delighted to be chairing the first in this series of In Conversation with Clicks webinars. I like the idea that they together they form a whole con the concept of the series of, of uh, webinars form a, a much broader understanding of what we're all facing as, uh, as we all deal with the realities of the pandemic. Um, I think we, it would be fair to say that uh, we've all been overwhelmed by the number of reports and studies and, and uh, investigations and things. I, I tried for a period to dedicate every morning, you know, an hour to read the latest in, uh, you know, how institutions across the world are handling, um, you know, the, the pandemic. But there comes a time when you do have to stop and share experiences like this in a, in a, in a, in a session um, I, you know, where, where we can listen to each other and genuinely understand the challenges that different parts of the world are going through and the opportunities as well as the lessons learned. And that's the focus of today's session. We're going to touch on a number of points, primarily around uh, how we as institutions have um, dealt with uh, the pandemic but then also what opportunities do we see and what lessons have we learned? So maybe just before I, I start talking about uh, and introducing the panelists, I'll, I'll say a few words about myself. So as uh, Dr. Nariman says, my name is Yusra Mizugi and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Muscat University here in the Sultanate of Oman. Uh, we're a very new and very young university. I'm delighted to say that I'm the first female vice chancellor here in Oman. So that's uh, you know, a huge um, you know, high point for me. Um, as a new institution, we've only been in operation about four years now. We have multiple challenges, um, challenges that possibly more established institutions don't have, but then we don't have the, the challenges of the established institutions. However, because we're new and we're very lean, we've been able to respond quite quickly to the, to the challenges that uh, Corona has, has posed us. Also, because we adopted a technological approach from the very beginning, that's really um, you know, come to fruition now at this stage in, in, you know, in, in being able to, to transition to online quite seamlessly. But I'm very interested to hear what other parts of the world and other institutions are dealing with. So, um, before I introduce the panelists, being an academic, I, I always have rules for everything. So if you don't mind, bear with me. I'm going to just share a few rules in terms of this webinar. Uh, my understanding is that we would like uh, participants to share any questions on the Q&A function rather than on the chat function, please. Um, if we can have all the questions on the Q&A, I'd really appreciate it. Um, no hand raising, please, because we won't be able to take uh, we won't be able to push the mic out to the audience. We'll, we'll be taking questions that are typed. Um, we will try to stick to time. So if you can keep your questions concise and similarly to the panelists, if I can ask you to keep uh, responses concise and to the point so that we can give everybody a fair opportunity to answer. And then um, if you're not speaking, can I, ha can I just ask that you mute your mic? just to, to avoid any uh, um, echo and all that. And finally, we will be um, putting 
uh, some polls out, some questions out to the audience, just to make sure no one is sleeping. So I'll be checking how many people are in the room and how many responses we've got. So please do engage with the polls so that we get an understanding of what's happening. Uh, and what the views are, and we'll build some questions around that. So that's just in terms of the, the etiquette, if you like, of, of this webinar and what we're hoping to do. Um, when Dr. Neriman got in touch with me, and you know, I, I really am very, very grateful, Neriman, um, and I'm honored that you asked me to kick off this first um, webinar. But when she asked me, did I want to chair the panel did, or did I want to uh, be a panelist? I said, it's fine, I, I can chair, I'm, I'm quite used to chairing. So I said yes. At that point, I didn't know who the panelists were. So um, when she sent me the list of names, I thought, oh my God, you know, um, these are very eminent, distinguished um, international higher education leaders. And, um, you know, so it puts a lot of pressure on me today to manage this uh, or to chair this discussion. But I also am privileged to be able to you know, draw on such wealth of experience from different parts of the world, from South Africa, from the United States, from Singapore, from, uh, from the United Arab Emirates. So it really is a pleasure. And I'm going to ask each one of the panelists, please, to introduce themselves just very briefly, maybe a, a one minute, just so that uh, we can do this um, well. So I'm going to start with you, Professor Tawana Coupe. Um, from the um, uh, as vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria, South Africa. Welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you very much uh, to Clix for inviting me on this panel. My name is Tawana Kope, vice chancellor and principal of the University of Pretoria, the capital of South Africa. We're a research intensive university, 55,000 students, 112 years old, in the top five in South Africa, and in the 1.9% in world rankings. Fantastic, excellent. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this, this evening, this afternoon. Dr. Abdul Latif Ishansi, President and CEO of the Higher Colleges of Technology in the United Arab Emirates, welcome. Thank you, Professor Yusra. Thank you for the introduction and I would like to thank Lex for this opportunity to discuss with the eminent speakers in the panel. Um, my name is Abdel Latif Shamsi. I am the president and CEO for the Higher Colleges of Technology in the United Arab Emirates. We are considered the largest higher education institution in the UAE. We have more than 25 or 23,000 students with 16 different campuses allocated throughout the country. And we focus heavily on the applied education. We deliver our undergraduate mainly at undergraduate institutions with a, a big, uh, with a large focus on the, uh, the applied part, the hands-on, and the practical part as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll go to uh, Dr. Julie. Dr. Julie Fresco, Vice President of Chippewa Valley Technical College in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Julie. Good evening, and I'm very happy to be serving on the panel with all of you esteemed educators. It's going to be interesting on how the whole world has approached this, uh, this pressing issue. Um, I'm currently serving as the Vice President for Academics at Chippewa Valley Technical College. Uh, we're an institution that is over 100 years old. If you're not familiar with the United States, uh, we're located in uh, North Central Wisconsin between Chicago and Minneapolis. Again, serving about 20,000 students in uh, two-year programs. Uh, the highest degree that we award is the associate degree and a whole range of programs, uh, very similar to uh, the, the last, my predecessor, uh, applied learning in healthcare, business, manufacturing, agriculture, IT, energy and transportation. And then we also have a very large uh, liberal arts transfer program as well. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. And last, but by no means least, Dr. Earl Lim, Vice Provost for Teaching Innovation and Quality at National University of Singapore, NUS. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for this opportunity. So NUS is uh, now 115 years old. This is our 115 NUS year. And we had a whole bunch of very big celebrations which completely have uh, been destroyed by COVID. Uh, we have 17 faculties and schools. We have 2000 modules each semester. We have about 28,000 undergraduate students and about 8,000 graduate students. And NUS is very proud to have uh, offered our students what we call continuing education and training or lifelong learning. 
So anyone in the last two years who's registered with NUS and retrospectively uh, for the last couple of years, all our students are offered 20 years to come back to university to, continue, uh, to do continual training. Uh, they are allowed to avail themselves of any of our courses for the upgrading. Uh, we have uh, 17 faculties and schools, including a uh, music school. Uh, we're paired with Yale University and with Duke as well. And uh, we have about 12,000 staff. So we have 50,000 students on campus. Right. Yeah, so hi everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Earl. We have a wonderful array of experience and, um, and numbers of students and a range of programs being offered, both research intensive and uh, applied and technical. So very interesting. And I think that this is what enriches the discussion. But before I start, uh, so just for, for the participants to clarify, we're going to ask each of the, of the panelists to share their thoughts, their initial thoughts with us. Um, and then we will move into a bit of more of an interactive uh, discussion and we'll end with an opportunity for question and answers. But before we do that, I would like to kick off with a, a poll question. So Elena, if I can ask you to please post the first poll question for the audience and um, hopefully give them some time to answer. And you'll see it's a very simple question. Um, how prepared was your institution for the COVID-19 situation? And uh, I love technology. Look at that. It's all kind of, um, you know, moving around. And I want to see when we hit about 100 response. So we're getting, wow, somewhat prepared. Seems to be coming out quite a lot. Let it go for another maybe five or six seconds, Elena, and then let's. Okay, shall we stop there? I think we've, you know, we, we've seemed to have settled at um, a particular, you know, a particular point, right? So you can see there that somewhat prepared is, is about 51%. Half of our participants say that their institutions were somewhat prepared. Interestingly, about 10% are you know, already uh, online institutions and 14% feel that they were not at all ready for this, uh, uh, this you know, transition to online and uh, you know, dealing with COVID on, on a total basis. So uh, very interesting. I mean, it's not surprising. I would say this is what I would have expected. Um, so great, great. Thank you very much. At least we know the polls work and the technology works. That, that's good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Elena. If we can take that off the screen, please, now. And I will now ask Prof Tawana to share his thoughts with us around um, the, um, the challenges, the opportunities, and some of the lessons. Let's just start with the challenges and, and opportunities. How prepared was your institution? for COVID-19. Sorry, before we do that, um, maybe we can ask uh, Elena to take the, the poll off the screen, if you don't mind. And I'll hand over to you, Prof Tawana, if you can share your thoughts, please. Thank you very much. Um, the University of Pretoria is an interesting university in relation to online teaching. We are primarily a contact and residential university, 55,000 students one of the largest in South Africa. But we are also relatively a well-resourced institution. So let me give you an example. Last year, we put in 100 million rand, or let's say 10 million US dollars to you know, modernize and strengthen our IT infrastructure. And I'm glad we did so, because then COVID came in 2020. But also historically, although we are a primarily a contact face-to-face -face university, since 1998, We've been experimenting and developing a new model of teaching and learning called hybrid teaching and learning. Some people call it blended teaching and learning. The way this works is that although the students come to class to learn face to face, there is a lot of use of online resources within those face to face classes, inside class, but also we use what is called a flipped teaching and learning model. Students have to prepare before class, and that preparation involves going online. And actually 96% of our undergraduate modules 
are online in a substantial and substantive way. Not just the name of the course on a website and so on, but teaching resources embedded uh, uh, online. So students have to actually prepare using online and also take quizzes and some assignments in preparation for class. In class, the professors will also use lots of online resources, quizzes and other related modes. And then the, that is what we call engaged teaching and learning. Then there's consolidation after class, where again, they have to stay online and actually, and actually learn to, to, to consolidate what they learned in class using online resources, but also to collaborate with each other as peers and continue the discussion of what happened in class. But also, they can also interact with the lecturer on, on, on various Q&A sessions on our teaching and learning uh, platform, which is Blackboard Collaborate, but we call it Click Up, which is uh, Click University of Pretoria. We do, in, before COVID, we assess this on a very continuous basis. So when COVID came, we were somewhat prepared, but at a higher level of somewhat prepared, not totally prepared because primarily we are not an online university, but a contact university that uses a hybrid model. But that helped us. So the fact that we had a strong IT platform and a culture and a practice of doing hybrid teaching and learning helped us relatively transition to, um, to online teaching and learning better than other institutions on the African continent. So we've been doing a lot of surveys and, and checking as how people are doing. Later on, I can give you the statistics of the latest survey. How are people actually operating on those platforms? But there was one challenge. South Africa and Africa is a continent of inequalities. And not all of our students had laptops and devices. I thought it was out of the 55,000, I thought it was tens of thousands. I was wrong in that regard. It turns out there are just under 3,000 or about 2,500 students only out of the 55,000 who needed these devices. So we delayed starting in order to make sure we could assist those students. So we raised money from the university, from our donors, and from even university staff. We created what is called a UP Solidarity Fund to actually assist the poorer students get these devices. So we also, because of our robust IT infrastructure, we create a portal where you don't need data in order to access teaching and learning. And there's no reverse billing. It's zero rated data wise. So it's, it's free to actually actually do teaching and learning. Although we found out later on that the problem was the following. A, once the students were doing tests and assignments, often the telecommunications companies would, would, would put us on the slower lane if you like, because we are not data, <laughs> we are not revenue generating. So we have data packages to be used for tests, quizzes and examinations. But otherwise, it's free for both staff and students, data-wise, to be able to access our teaching and learning portal. Once you, are, you go into our portal using your student or staff, you can go anywhere. You can go to YouTube or whatever. We have had, of course, to block certain sites that were not exactly for teaching and learning. I will not tell you which ones those ones were, but you all know students and, and, and perhaps even some staff. So, because lack of data is a big challenge on the African continent. And also not just lack of, rather not lack of data, the, the cost of data is very high. As many countries experience telecommunications monopolies, same in South Africa. So the other challenge we faced was our international students. Many universities like ours have international students. At the lockdown, some decided to return to their countries. And now, because there's no international travel, they can't come back. So some have a difficulty accessing our portal, because our portal is a deal between South African telecommunications companies and the University of Pretoria, the same with other universities. So once they are outside the country, they don't have the same access. Although some students, I think, in countries where some of our telcos have international operations, we can see students from 20 countries, including in the Middle East, are connecting onto our portal and actually being able to study as well. Then we two last categories of students. Students who come from poor rural areas without electricity and connectivity. They are not a large number. 
at the University of Pretoria, but they still exist. So we are sending them hard copy material and we are using telephone tutoring twice a week. Somebody will call them and have a lesson with them. We also kept some, some of them behind when the lockdown happened because we realized they would have even life, life problems if they come from poor backgrounds. We are also asking some of them in the last two weeks to come back because we are allowed to retain physically 33% of our students who need lab sciences, they are in their final year, they're doing medicine, they're doing veterinary science. We are a very comprehensive university. We teach everything from agriculture to veterinary science. We're the only university that teaches veterinary science in South Africa, the second one in Southern Africa. So we, we, we actually teach for a, for a very a huge region. And also, so, what's, so I can say that we have made the transition relatively easier than some of the institutions in our own country and in definitely in our own continent. But this is because we have a long history of hybrid teaching and learning as a philosophical mode. But although we were, as I said, primarily a contact institution. The last thing is mental health and stress. So some students and staff have faced mental health and stress because it's not easy to suddenly transition from a hybrid system into a singular system away from the institution where the IT platforms and the Wi-Fi work very, very well. So we, 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 that, that, that we, have, we, have, we have used our online counseling PA support and we have a partnership with a, with a, a large NGO that does counseling for anxiety and depression. That's but good. time has run out for this phase. Yeah. I'll come back with other things later on. Thank you very much. What an interesting um, experience. I mean, uh, for me at least, what, one of the things that's really caught my attention, this access to free data. Uh, look, my background is, is very much in the UK. I've lived all my life in the UK and now coming to the Middle East more recently, you realize the cost of data is actually at sometimes prohibitive uh, for, yeah. for some students from less privileged backgrounds. And therefore yes, having that is really, uh, because you can provide, you can provide uh, you know, laptops and you can provide, but as long as they have a network that they can tap into and you can give them that access, that's really super. Thank you very much. Uh, what a very interesting. Let's try and compare that uh, with um, the experiences at higher colleges with you, uh, Dr. Abdullah, and maybe how prepared was you know what was the experience at higher colleges of technology and you know how do you, how do you rate your level of preparedness for this pandemic that we're facing? Okay, thank you, Professor Isra. It's. Uh, I would rate it within the 10%, 100% smooth transition, and I'll tell you why with numbers and facts. Um, by the time we get the presentation and on, just to show some, some figures into that, I would like to say that the technology has been embedded into our education system from the very, very old days. Since the invention of TV, since 1954, we've been using TV to, for, as an educational tool, and then with the internet in 1992, it's becoming in, more integrated into our teaching and learning. And of course, in 2007, with the iPhones and iPads, it's become more and more interactive rather than one way of communication. So technology has always been integrated into our education system. Now, what we have today, and I think COVID-19 provided us as educator, a golden opportunity to, to prove what we've been advocating for. What do I mean by that? That how can we use a technology to become more closer to our the, the, the Z generation who are more of a tech savvy and how they are more excited about learning. And we don't, because we as educators, we still kind of follow the traditional way of, of delivering our instructions. We've been pushed, in fact, and accelerated many of the new methods and ways of teaching rather than the traditional way. So if I can go through quickly this uh, presentation I have, <clears throat> I don't know if uh, Alina was able to upload the presentation. Okay. Um, our transformation okay. happened. Our transformation happened in the next slide, showing a chronological summary of what we've been doing. So, if we go to the second slide here, uh, since the announcement of COVID-19, fortunately, we had between uh, March 4th and 5th a pilot phase before we go into a break to go in a full-time online delivery mode. That was a good opportunity to see where are the gaps are. So, when we come back. On the 22nd of March, 
for the seven weeks, we were able to deliver a full online education. And online is, is I mean, it's blended, like what Professor Tawan was saying. It's already been embedded into our education system. But when you go in a full time, and online mode, I think that also presents some kind of a challenge. And the next slide, what we have um, showing, because we are the largest, on the side before, yeah, we are the largest higher education institution in the UA with the 23,000 students. We've been monitoring how our students coping with the online. And we've been uh, surveying our faculty and, our, and, and showing an, an overall satisfaction of 85%. In fact, what's interesting, when we start um, measuring the satisfaction of our faculty, it started with about 70%. On a weekly basis, by the end of this second term, we found it pushed up to about 91%. And the reason where we, the, our faculty become more and more comfortable about using the online tools, becoming more engaged, for our students was from the beginning. Our students were so excited, it's convenient. They open their laptops early in the morning, their instructors are on their laptops, uh, live, engaging. But also students, they start to realize it's a serious business. There are exams associated with that, uh, projects need to be submitted, homework, and that also have also pushed our students to be more and more engaging into this, into our programs. We deliver about 70 programs different throughout 16 different campuses, but let me show you some quick results. In the next slide, through those seven weeks, in fact, of delivery of online, we have delivered 1.4 million hours of teaching and learning on uh, online for our students. We had so many, and we, I mean, those numbers considered to be one of the largest globally, to be honest with you. And, but what's more interestingly, because we provided PD hours, because we know always the challenge is to bring our faculty up to date. We've been introducing e-teacher certification by Blackboard for the past two years. And that's what made it an easier transformation. So we had about 55,000 PD hours been pro available for our students. Interestingly, we are fortunate in the UAE because it's a very well known globally. We have a very strong and solid IT infrastructure. We had almost a very minimal issue when it comes to the network and data being available for our students. In the next slide, I want to show to complete, it's not only about delivering instruction, it's about assessing. And that was a, a, quite of a challenge for all of us. How do we get the validity, the credibility of our assessment program? So we have. Um, came up with a different strategies for assessments, but yet still examination and testing was part of it, where students have to sit in front of their laptops being recorded, all those sessions. So we have uh, achieved more four, about 4 million minutes of recorded online assessments. Uh, 59,000 exams uh, were, were taken by our students. Um, again, there were some minor reports where technical incidents were reported, was resolved within two minutes. But again, that it helped us just to complete the cycle of our online. Uh, in the next slide, we introduce summer and we want to see how our students are happy with our summer delivery. This year, we had a 20% increase of our summer registered students. We have 15,600 students have registered for the summer. You know what is the greatest advantage? We have 16 campuses. Students tend to, to register within their own campus. Uh, among all the CRNs being delivered online, we had 51 students registered from different locations at the same CRNs. And that is something very interesting for a multi-campus type of situation. So that's an, 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 an advantage for the online delivery. And because we are in the United Arab Emirates, we give students the option to go whether to a, a men's or women's campus, kind of segregated. With the online, we were able to achieve nearly 20% of our students with the mixed gender classes. That has also put us in an, an, an advantage to be more efficient in providing and delivering our instructions. Um, if I think what, what makes it next, if we just quickly, I will summarize with the next slides, so I'll give the uh, opportunity for the rest of the panel members also. What we strongly believe and the challenges we face First of all, we, we are an applied education institution. No matter how much we use simulations and apps and animation as part of online delivery, still the hands-on is important. We strongly advocate today for what we call a persona 4.0 for our graduates. And the persona 4.0 that we need to prepare our graduates for the post-COVID-19 jobs that depends that they have to be a digital persona. We've seen that through our online delivery of instructions. 
professional persona where we have embedded many of the professional certification externally into every program we offer within HCP and more importantly, entrepreneurial persona. I strongly believe the entrepreneurial persona what will make the difference in the post COVID-19. We've seen the employment rate is going down everywhere globally in the private sector, in the governmental sector, in the public sector. Entrepreneurial is what is going to lead the changes and to embed those kind of skills and competencies into our students. This is what we will make us better prepared for the post COVID-19. So I will maybe stop in this slide here and I'm sure there are many questions from the participants as well. We'll talk about it later on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdel Latif. Again, a really interesting experience. I mean, what caught my eye there was the um, 16 campuses and trying to um, orchestrate um, the, the delivery of online for applied, research, uh, applied teaching across such a widespread campus with so many students is no easy task. Even just collecting this data that you have shared with us just now is, uh, is in itself you know, uh, a, ta a task. Um, so very, very interesting. I, I mean, I, I've made a couple of points and, and for me, you touched on something very, very important around assessment. And no doubt we'll come back to assessment yes. in a minute. Well, thanks. I've been told that my voice echoes when I move, and I'm one of those um, people who have Mediterranean blood in them and, and has to move when I talk. So I, I'll try to be very still, but I'll, I'll let me know if you still can't hear me very well. So thank you very much for both experiences from Prof. Toana and Dr. Abdel Latif. I would like to take another uh, poll question now and just see before, before I, I ask Dr. Judy to join us. Elena, can we have the second poll question? Um, around research and COVID-19, I'm asking, has presented multiple opportunities for research in research. Do people feel that this is a good, you know, do you agree with this statement? Have you benefited either yourself or in your institution um, from research opportunities because of COVID? Has there been funding? What do you think has been the, um, you know, the, the basis, if you like, or the, the outcomes in terms of opportunities for research? Bearing in mind, we're trying to focus on some opportunities coming out. Give it a few more seconds because only 65% of our participants have voted. And the other 44%, I'm going to, not 44, 34. Um, get people to, if we can hit 100, I'll stop there. Okay, so this is almost equal. This is amazing. 43% um, of our participants strongly agree that COVID has presented multiple opportunities for research and 47%, just a bit more, um, just agree. Uh, so if, if you add those two up, You've got a very, very high percentage of uh, of our of our participants saying that uh, they have either they strongly agree or agree with uh, the fact that um, COVID presents opportunities in research. Only ten percent disagree, and one percent strongly disagree. So really, really interesting. An obvious um, commitment and a, uh, a view that research has really taken off because of, of COVID. So that's an excellent result. I, you know, we, we're all very, as academics, I think we're all very keen to see more research opportunities being made available. So thank you very much for your responses there. Uh, Dr. Julie, can I ask you to share your thoughts about how your institution, completely different part of the world um, in the United States, how, how is your institution fared and how ready were you and what are the opportunities that you see there? Your mic uh, is, is off, so if you could put your mic on, please. Well, thank you. And although we are clearly in a very different part of the world geographically, I would say our approach was very similar to the two previous approaches that we've heard. I would characterize our institution was somewhat uh, ready for the transition. We certainly knew it was coming and we kept um, telling our faculty, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And finally, uh, as in the other two cases in, in mid-March, uh, that is when it actually came. So all of our classroom and laboratory instruction was moved to remote delivery. 
Uh, we used our mid-March, basically the time when the students were on spring break, uh, to make the transition. So when the students came back from their spring break, uh, everything was done remotely. Uh, now, in most cases, this meant online delivery using our learning management system. Uh, we use Canvas. We heard the last speaker say that they were using Blackboard. We're using Canvas, very similar. Uh, but that even that didn't work for some of our programs. Uh, we have a very popular culinary program. Well, again, it's hard to actually have the, the food over the learning management system. So we had our chefs making meal kits that the students would drive by and pick up their meal kits. And then they would make their meals, photograph their meals, and send the photographs to their instructors uh, for critique. Uh, so that was rather innovative. Uh, same approach was used with our, our cosmetology students uh, because, again, it's not so easy to give someone a, a hairstyle online. Um, we moved our student services, our administrative uh, services, and basically all of the employees were working remotely. Uh, all of our buildings were pretty much in lockdown mode uh, with the exception of maintenance, security, and the two kind of drive up programs that I talked about. Um, certainly, you know, before COVID, we had many online programs. We had more than 20 completely online programs. Uh, like the first speaker, we were already doing a lot of blended instruction, uh, which at our institution we call My Choice. So the students have a choice to come to class or to be online, depending on their schedule and other responsibilities. Uh, but we did find that when we went to nearly 100% online, uh, that there were issues with access. Uh, we are located in a very rural part of the United States. We're not really close to any major cities. Uh, so we did find there were students that didn't have, and faculty and actually, that didn't have very robust or reliable internet access. And we didn't have a clear government solution as well. Certainly some of the uh, internet providers did step up and say they would give discounts or free data to, to teachers and students. But again, not all of us are using the same internet provider. Uh, so it was very difficult. Uh, we actually had uh, parking lots and other public spaces that was said, you know, internet signage here. So we had many students, not only at our institution, but at other institutions, uh, doing their homework in, in their cars, in their parking lots, uh, just because we didn't, we don't have a, a national structure for, for data, as was mentioned by the previous speaker. Um, again, like the first speaker, uh, we did receive some government funding. We also used uh, funding from donors and our student emergency fund uh, to try to deliver a technology, whether that be a laptop or a hotspot. Uh, to a student um, in need, uh, but it, it was a challenge. Uh, and we certainly um, found out, we always had heard, well, not every student has technology, not every student has robust internet access, and we found that was indeed the case. Um, certainly our government did come through with funding uh, called the CARES Act, and that um, helps us uh, to improve our capacity for delivering remote learning it also helps to assist students with any financial hardships that they've occurred uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so we have been taking advantage of that funding uh, to ensure that we will have a better student technology, faculty technology, uh, PPE for our uh, medical training programs uh, going forward. Uh, we did bring students back this summer as again, some of our programs in the manufacturing and healthcare areas uh, really couldn't be delivered completely online and our accrediting bodies and our state licensure in some cases required uh, so many hours of, of hands-on uh, practice. Uh, so we are up and running on a very limited term this summer. Uh, all class sizes are smaller than 10 students. Uh, where you're having social distancing, all of our students, faculty and staff, if they're on one of our campus, they must wear a face mask. Uh, and in preparation for fall, uh, we are requiring that every student have a device that's appropriate for their program. Uh, so if we end up having to move either by choice or by chance to complete de remote delivery for fall, 
uh, we know that everyone will be in a position to, to learn if we go back into that lockdown or quarantine situation. Uh, I think we'll talk about this later in the panel, um, but certainly uh, lessons learned, um, yeah, some bruises and bumps along the way, uh, but many, many opportunities. Um, and we've certainly heard from students, uh, faculty and staff that um, we are, we're learning from this experience and we only hope it will improve our quality as we move into future terms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Julie. Thank you again. Uh, extremely uh, interesting and insightful uh, set of experiences there. They say um, necessity is the mother of all invention and um, I think we're all looking very deep into our um, innovative selves to find new ways of engaging um, this you know, I, I'm calling it the Corona cohort because they are, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they are characterized by the fact that they have had to live through this and they've, they've had to learn how to deal with this. And as acad academics and as leaders of institutions, it's very interesting what you're just sharing about the meal kits and, um, you know, trying to find ways of supporting these students and not stop their learning process. I will hopefully come back to you um, around, um, you know, access and, and the fact that you were already set up. But let's give Dr. Earl maybe an opportunity to share his thoughts. There's so much that we could pick up. So, um, Dr. Earl, thank you very much for being so patient and uh, being the last one up. But it would be very interesting to hear the experiences that the National University of Singapore and in, in that part of the world um, what your experiences have been um, with this transition now? Uh, so we, Singapore is, is a very small island with, uh, we've got one, two major universities, now we have five. Uh, NUS is the oldest of the universities. Um, Singapore has no natural resources and we're an island and we are also very dependent on our neighbours. So NUS is a very has a large international student pool. Uh, we heard about COVID, I would guess, probably middle to late January when word started breaking out. And because I'm a doctor as well, uh, you know, we had been discussing it within the hospitals. But uh, I think nearer our Chinese New Year, we then started hearing about, you know, how, how China was, was having this horrible outbreak. And our worry then was what happens during the Chinese New Year, because we know that people were traveling. Anyway, that, that's just the preamble to our preparations. But, you know, Singapore has gone through SARS in 2003, H1N1, MERS, COV, uh, a whole bunch of different pandemics. So we've actually been quite used to it in, in that uh, in 2003, we were completely taken by surprise. In, uh, fortunately for us, it didn't really affect uh, our, our exams too much. But that was when we first realized we had to go uh, online and we had to take uh, steps to make sure we were better prepared. That being said, it took us another four years before we mandated online lessons. So people started exploring online education. Uh, in 2007, we started this thing called uh, e-learning week, where we would mandate that for a week every year, all our staff and students could not come to campus and we had to do online learning. And this was because we felt it was absolutely essential that our students and staff learn how to do online education. So that being said, you know, with despite e-learning, when H1N1, when MERS-CoV broke out, we were still relatively unaffected and we, we thought we were well prepared. So rather than using Canvas or Blackboard, any of the rest, we have our own uh, LMS. And uh, I, I would say that uh, we have embraced technology and online education, but we are still not fully online. And many of our academics would uh, revolt if we force them to go online. Uh, so my, my task, my job actually was created so that we could, uh, we could push more online uh, and more blended learning. And in fact, uh, we've, we're now members of ed edX and Coursera. We have put out seven MOOCs on, on edX. Uh, we have put out, I think, four MOOCs and two specializations in Coursera. And we flipped their MOOCs on campus as well as making our own teachers do their blended learning. So about, of the 2,800 model, uh, modules about, we have about 500 modules over the years that have gone online. Some have been retired and some new ones have come up. Uh, so anyway, uh, 
we, we were prepared, but I wouldn't say we were well prepared. We were just anticipating and we started, you know, we had already started making plans to go online. For me and for us, the, the, the fear was online exams because you realize that um, I think in the world we do online teaching very well, but online exams and online assessments are not well done. No one has done it well. And uh, so that was something that was quite scary. Uh, you know, we started going uh, from green to yellow and then orange. And when we went hit orange, that was the, the, the DOS con. We were quite worried because suddenly we had three weeks and our, effect, uh, our effective lockdown came about. So we had been making plans where we allowed classes of, let's say, 50 in a class, face to face, without masks and with masks, then 25 in a you know, physically distant space. And suddenly we were saying, no, you can't do that. Everyone goes online. So this was with three weeks to go and we had to then plan our exams. Uh, proctoring solutions had been looked at since early January, but no one was offering a reasonably priced, good, reliable solution. Uh, ExamSoft, which does exemplify, had, had been planning their, their proctoring solution, but it wasn't available in Singapore. So everybody who was jumping on the bandwagon to offer us proctoring was offering it to us at great cost, but not wasn't you know there was nothing that assured us that it would be well done so uh, my team came up with our own proctoring solution with zoom uh, with external cameras and a, a second device uh, and we actually used exemplify as well as some of our other called our other online tools and we ran the exams quite successfully before we started planning for the exam we had two minor cheating uh, incidents, which created a furore within our, our, our Singapore community. But fortunately, once we started proctoring and we planned for our exams, we had no major cheating incidents, one or two minor complaints. And uh, you know, when, when everyone goes online, you can expect somebody's going to do a little bit of cheating. But we, we essentially planned uh, and we taught our teachers. We had our teams from the pedagogy center as well as our online education center create teaching modules, webinars. We had multiple sessions. And then for the exams, we, we had multiple helplines, um, Microsoft Teams, uh, help groups, etc. So that the exams went fully online with almost no glitches. I'll say though that our glitches were entirely outside in US. So when we, we were running our exams on ExamSoft, Exemplify, we reached out to all the partners, ExamSoft, Zoom, everyone and we made sure that they were aware we were running exams during these three weeks and they had to be on hand things that that were horrifying for us we had planned zoom proctoring and one week before the exam start uh, started uh, zoom bombing happened in america and then in singapore and suddenly our ministry banned zoom and so you can imagine my my fright because i had already made all these plans for zoom and that wasn't allowed so i then arranged meetings with zoom uh, in America, in Taiwan, etc. And then having got their, uh, their assurance that they would help us sit with us through the process, they worked with my team. And then we went back to the ministry and said, look, we, we are very sure this will happen uh, without any incident. And so we managed to get things done. So I, I'm ending here, but I'll just tell you that uh, really COVID, you know, when I was discussing it in our senior management team, we were, we were saying that COVID is like an extinction event. If you think of the meteor strike that destroyed the dinosaurs, this was it for the world. I mean, uh, you know, Avianca, the Venezuelan airline, has almost gone bankrupt, if not for being saved by the government. Uh, Hertz, multiple car companies, etc., are going bankrupt. In fact, in Singapore, many restaurants are going bankrupt. And we said that if we do not change, our universities in Singapore, in the world, will go bankrupt. So, in fact, Australian National University was just announcing its I think 50 million debt or something and it had to be built up by the government. We made sure that we looked after our students. We made sure that business went on as far as possible. We didn't throw anyone out. In fact, we, we continued education online. We even looked after our students and brought them back <clears throat> to campus so that they could do their quarantining on campus. So for us, it was a test of our ability to survive. It was also a test of our, our relationship with the community and we made sure that we, you know, we triumphed. I wouldn't say we did everything well. Uh, we relied on technology a lot. We had, uh, you can imagine with kids, 
uh, on campus. We had students who tried to, to run out of the, um, the, the dorm rooms and, and mingle with each other. And we used technology as much as possible to prevent that. So I realized I'm probably at the end of my five minutes, but I just wanted to tell you that our plans were not just for online education, online assessments, but included research opportunities, included um, even quarantining and ensuring our students that anyone who comes on campus has no fever, has no symptoms, and is safe and has done the declarations. So we came up with multiple online tools, apps. Uh, we, we came up with all kinds of things like even a Bluetooth tracking device. Once you come near another student or a teacher, you're automatically recorded as having been in contact so that if you get someone who has the disease, you can immediately track them. Uh, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Earl. Thank you. Again, an amazing experience. Obviously, very technologically ahead and uh, lots of utilization of, of technology. Um, I mean, I, I love the analogy you just used about the meteor effect and uh, the extinction, extinction of dinosaurs. You know, it's, it, it is very much about the survival of the fittest. Um, I'm a pot, uh, I'm a, um, you know, I'm an optimist. And I like to think that if universities have lasted for the last thousand years, that we will collectively uh, work together to ensure that we, we hopefully last the next thousand. But you're right, not everybody will last. And uh, we have to be very careful as to what are the, the ingredients that will make for a successful um, institution going forward. So much is um, worth picking up from all four panelists. I must say thank you very much for being such a good panel in terms of sticking to time. It means that I am still very much on track to pick up some of those questions. Dr. Neriman is doing an excellent job of uh, filtering the questions that are coming in on the Q&A section. But if we don't mind, I'm going to take the other, the last two poll questions, I think, because I do think they will be very useful uh, in uh, framing the rest of this discussion. So Elena, can I ask you to put up our third question? And um, it is about the next steps. We say here, areas of greatest concern going forward for my institution for the next academic year. So as, a, as, an, as an academic or an academic leader, what concerns you most? Is it online delivery? Is it assessment mechanisms? Is it planning for the student return to campus? Some of you will have um, lots of international students and that becomes a concern, of course. And um, staff and, and student mental health and well-being. Um, we've talked a lot about um, physical health, but I actually think um, the, the dialogue hasn't covered mental health as much as it could have. Or maybe it's all of the above that keep you up at night. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear what our participants think. Um, is concerning or you know it seems to be quite equal at the moment actually relatively equal lots of people think everything is a worry um, and this is why we need to be discussing and coming up with with ideas of how we we deal with these things again we'll reach 100 uh, responses Elena and then maybe you know take a snapshot there 100 is about 75 percent so that should be quite good Actually, from the questions that uh, Dr. Neriman is sending me, assessment seems to be a big one. So we'll pick up on assessment in a minute. But then we've got, thank you very much, um, Elena. We've got all of, all of the above as 42%. Maybe I shouldn't have put that one, that's, that's a catch-all. And then um, we've got assessment mechanisms as the next big thing. Interestingly, online delivery isn't such an issue. People seem to be quite comfortable with online delivery now and, and have absorbed uh, what, what that requires. International students, again, not a, not a huge one. Very, very interesting. So assessment is, is, a, is a big one there. Elena, can I ask you to move us to the fourth and final question, and then we can use those as a basis. Sorry, could I just make a, a comment though? Please, uh, online de sorry, online delivery actually has it's, it's a very vague term and I think, you know, it's not difficult for many people to say that they just convert their lectures and, and record them online. You know, you can use apps like Pen Opto, you can have a CCTV in the, in the classroom. And I think one of the things that really all educational institutions have to struggle with is how to uh, 
to reliably and authentically convert the, what is normally a face-to-face -face session into an online format that works because just delivering it to camera is basically still a lecture and actually many people struggle with online content, uh, communication and interaction. So I think although we, we say with confidence we do online well or that we're not worried about online delivery, I think online education is still not perfect. It's okay. And, and that's why I made the comment that online assessment and exams are still the way forward. Uh, when I was talking to our colleagues, our, our Vice Dean of Science made a comment that, uh, you know, no matter how much we push for, for online, even in COVID times, we need to worry about authentic assessment. You can't create uh, an, uh, an, a biologist by having them watch David Attenborough on YouTube. And so that, that, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I thought it was an important point to make because I, I think it's something we will struggle with. Very valid point. Thank you very much, Dr. Earl. Very, very valid point. I think uh, I, I would agree with you completely. I think from a pedagogical perspective, writing a module for online delivery and writing a module for face-to-face -face delivery take completely different shapes and guises. And therefore, if we just take what was supposed to be delivered on a face-to-face -face setting and just you know, plant it into an online uh, platform, it's not going to work. Of course it's not. And I think being aware of that is, is, is very important. But we'll come back to that in a minute. There's a lot to pick up there. The final question, international higher education leaders um, will uh, face future uh, challenges like COVID. What is the most important lesson you have learned from this one? What is it that you've learned? Is it about the investment in technology? Is there something around in the importance of financial liquidity so that we can come through times of, of uh, you know, severe times like this one? Staff training or future planning? And interestingly, liquidity, financial liquidity, doesn't seem to be featuring very highly at all here. So I'll take this statistic back to my board of directors on Wednesday <laughs> and share with them this. But um, there's a lot around investment in staff training, um, future planning, but technology. Technology seems to be, you know, just pipped it there at 35%. So excellent, really quite interesting responses. I really would have thought that I was expecting financial liquidity and financial position to come out quite high there, but obviously not such a, a great concern, more around training and, and planning and technology investment. Fantastic. Wow. Thank you all very much for your responses. There's a lot of rich material to pick up here, but maybe if I can take those questions and, and pose them to... Um, to our panelists, um, particularly around assessment. I think maybe we start from, from that point, around assessment and um, some of the challenges of, of assessment on, on, online. Uh, we've all seen a spike probably in collusion and plagiarism. Uh, how are we dealing with it? Um, how are we engaging students so that they are aware of a changed assessment method? Um, maybe can I ask you, Dr. Julie, for your thoughts on this? What are you doing in the U.S.? Well, this certainly was an important consideration as we moved, particularly our, our traditional classroom and laboratory programs into the remote delivery. Uh, in fact, it was probably one of the first questions faculty asked, how will I be able to give secure exams? Um, in the past, in, you know, in the, the previous world, we had assessment centers on our campuses uh, where students who did need to take a particularly high stakes exam or a licensure exam uh, could you know, be proctored, you know, live proctors in an assessment center. Uh, well, that was no longer going to be the case. Uh, what we did, and I, and I had to smile when I heard um, the professor from Singapore, is we, Zoom was initially one of our solutions until our CIO banned us from using Zoom because of the, the Zoom bombing and the security risks. So um, then we share a similar experience with that. Uh, we did settle upon a product called um, Respondus Lockdown Browser. Um, is it perfect? You know, I don't know. It's been a while since I've actually been in the classroom using it, uh, but it is one that our, our faculty, our CIO and um, faculty development team agreed 
uh, that would be appropriate. Uh, so that is the solution that we settled on. Um, Thank you. Great. Give, Thank you. To give secure exams, although there certainly are a number of, of similar products uh, in, available in the U.S. Um, I hadn't, haven't heard, I haven't really talked to many faculty that had any real issues uh, with it or problems with it. Um, I'm sure as the faculty start to return to campus, we'll get more feedback on it. Uh, but I really haven't heard much positive or negative at this stage as the spring term has recently ended. Uh, we you. did have some faculty and some programs that really said they couldn't do those final skills checkoffs or exams uh, in any kind of online way. And uh, we respected that. And so we did, as soon as we were able to bring students safely in to our campuses, uh, again, using all the social distancing and all the, the hygiene protocols, uh, we did give skills exams and, and those types of things for our healthcare and our manufacturing programs. Um, Thank you, Dr. Judy. Thank you very much. I wanted to take that same type of question to Dr. Abdul Latif, if you don't mind. Given the, uh, the emphasis of higher colleges of technology on applied learning and technical, um, how, how were you able to transition to um, online assessment? How did you handle online assessment in such an applied setting? Um, I strongly believe today as we are becoming more and more innovative of delivering our pedagogy through the online, like what the Professor Earl just, uh, when he said, how do we define online? By the same token, we should be also um, offering our assessment in different ways and different approaches. We have to depart from the traditional way of thinking that I have to bring students to class with a piece of paper and sit in front of me to answer that piece of paper. That, that's, I think we need to change. We, are, we need to always think in a situation of the students. This is a Z generation. They are tech savvy. They are more engaged with the technology. It, now we know 85% of any job depends on the skills, not on the knowledge. That's extremely critical to think. It's how you find the information, how do you put it, how do you answer. Um, the assessment, we make it open for our faculty. Things of different alternatives. By the way, one of the good practices I will encourage all university presidents, vice chancellors, is to teach. I teach during the summer. I teach because although I've been teaching for 20 years, but teaching fully online makes you as a, as a leader to learn what challenges faculty will face. I mean, changing to an online will create some kind of fatigue because it's not just post, posting your PowerPoint presentation on a, on, on a laptop screen. That's not the way it works. Coming up with a creative, interactive way to engage students, offering quizzes within the same lecture and every lecture that you deliver. There are many different ways and tools of assessment that need to be embedded today, and we have to come up with a creative way. Yes, with what Julia just referred, we use lockdown browser. It is a good way to monitor students technically, and it's been helping us to do that. We record all those sessions. We know today students are smarter than us to find a way if they want to cheat. We had students in some of the lectures connecting with China real time, taking a photo of their exams from screen, sending it through WhatsApp. They have, they bid, by the way, for an answers in China. They send back the answers within less than five to 10 minutes. And you send them a payment through BiPAL. Now, there's many innovative ways to cheat if we want to. If we, so that's why I think thinking differently about assessment is extremely important. And think differently about delivering our education system. For the past five decades, our education system is going almost the same, by the way. Yet we find what we pay for tuition it shoots up 14 times as much what we used to pay five decades ago. Yet we still earn for that degree or that credential that we think it's what makes us a different or give us a better job opportunity. Today, we realize jobs does not depend on your bachelor degree or your associate degree or any diploma. It depends what skills you obtain. Now we find companies recruiting many of our graduates during internship without waiting until they get an offer for uh, they complete their degree. Why? Because they are creative, they are skilled, 
and they think more of a, like the, the, what the Z generation is more creative in their offering and their solutions. Yeah. It's a skill based and I think our approach need to think and, but let me conclude with this thing. What we've done in the past semester, we offered the opportunity for students to change in their final grade from a grade, letter grade to a pass, no pass. That itself made me more comfortable and making an assessment like an open lab and explore because I will not punish the students because we have changed the method that with the way we assess them. So as students have a choice and instead of getting a letter grade to get a pass or no pass without impacting their GPA. With this opportunity is available. It's an open lab for us. It's a chance where we explore many different ways and strategies for assessment, many different tools without punishing our students at the, the same time. That's why it's a golden opportunity. That's why what we have achieved, it's going, it's, it's, we're going to capitalize on it in the, in the very near future. Our learning when we go back and forth is absolutely is not going to be the same way we taught three months ago. Definitely, 100%, everywhere, in every country, in every organization. Yes, yes absolutely. Very, very interesting. I really like this idea. It would be very good to may, maybe touch base on that and, and find out the, the, the kind of the technicalities around this pass, no pass, and the option to go with that, because that sounds like a very um, interesting and allows for so much flexibility for both the students and the, and the staff involved. Um, there is a lot there that we do need to come to grips with. And I completely agree with you around the skills and the importance of skills for the future. Uh, when, um, when I was doing my degree, it was a different world that, than what my daughter and, and what our, you know, our kids doing here in the universities. And for example, what we're doing here at Muscat University is we've introduced the very first time in Oman a year long placement because that's the only way we believe that students will learn. It's a recognition that we're taking a, a page out of your book and you know, the higher colleges of technology and saying, look, we can't teach everything inside the university. You're gonna have to go out and learn it in industry. How you assess that then poses the next set of questions and, and how you deal with that. So really very, very interesting and insightful thoughts. In terms, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on time. I, we still have to take, uh, we're very keen to take questions from, from, the, from, the pan, from the participants. There are lots of questions coming in, but I would like to ask each one of you um, just one quest, one for one, less than a minute. What is the one lesson you have learned from COVID? Just, you know, in short, sharp terms, before we, we move to the, to the Q&A, what's the one thing you've learned as a, as a leader of an, in, an, in your higher education institution? Um, what's the one thing you've learned? And Professor Tawana, you've been very quiet. You've put your camera off, so I'm going to start with you. What's the one thing you've learned? Your mic is off, so. Sorry, I, did, I lost your question when the mic was cancelling. Sorry? The, the, it went off a little bit when, when you were asking me, you said, what's my last, what's the yes. last event? In just in a nutshell, in a, in a very short, concise response, what, what's the one thing you feel you've learned most as a result of COVID in terms of your obviously professional role? No, I think that we are able actually to transition in an unprecedented, in an unprecedented unexpected event. Our management systems and our technology are such that we can transition credibly. There will be some difficulties and challenges at the beginning, but we have such a management system and team and technology that we can smooth out those challenges and those glitches at the beginning and reload. And that we should actually be much bolder in our online, uh, even bolder in our online offering than we've been. Because I think two decades of working on it, we were being tentative, we were just making it complementary to our face-to-face -face teaching. So now what we're going to do is you're going to see an explosion of what we offer online and even more and more use of hybrid, including in assessments and including, by the way, some of the stuff where I didn't talk about research, where a research intensive. We've learned to do quite a lot of some of those research things with some of the things you can Great, do on. Thank you. 
does not require labs to be able to do it. That's great, thank you. Um, there's obviously it's the trust that we can do this, that we can transition. Very important point. Thanks a lot, uh, yeah. Prof. Joanna. Can I ask you, Dr. Earl, or Professor Earl, sorry, uh, what your one, you know, very concise, one lesson that you feel you've learned because of this COVID? Uh, hi, sorry, I wasn't sure whether I was on mute. Uh, it's an opportunity. Uh, I've been doing technology and education for the last four years for the university and at a different, uh, in a different capacity before that. And we've been, we've been pushing slowly towards it. But with one fell swoop, COVID has completely changed everything. Now everybody explores online. Uh, people are welcoming of it. Uh, I, I had wanted to put it on my hand earlier. So if you don't mind, let me just uh, have one minute to, to make a comment. So now many people jumping on the bandwagon of of uh, MOOCs, et cetera, online, uh, you know, edX, uh, Coursera, Udemy, you name it. And uh, it's actually something that I'm struggling with. In fact, I'm appearing in an edX forum in a few days time because uh, we've been discussing how NUS's edX uh, offerings uh, play into our roles. So, you, you know, if you think about it, all universities are now exploring an online presence. They are also exploring online degrees, online uh, masters, micro masters, micro degrees. Uh, NUS is also exploring bringing in MOOCs, etc., into our, our courses so that our students can avail themselves of these opportunities, not just for them to explore and to add on, but we are going to eventually even explore having part of these MOOCs by reliable, you know, good universities uh, to to supplement what we're doing. For example, out of 160 MCs or modular credits, you might Sorry, say. Can I I'm sorry, Dr. Earl, I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm just conscious okay. of time. And no the way. list of questions keeps growing as we're talking. So right. I just need to make sure I, I cover both uh, Dr. Julie and Dr. Abdul Latif. And then we Can take I questions. Can I my point in 10 seconds? Please. Sorry. Okay, so the point is this. What does it really mean? Because you don't want it to be that you offer all these things. At, at the end of it, the employers don't, don't appreciate it. If it doesn't count for anything, what are we doing? So that, that was the point I wanted to make. And I'm sorry for, for dragging this up. No apologies. No, no apologies needed. Thank you very much. Dr. Julie, as concise as possible, what have you learned? I'll make it very simple. I think we really learned the value of collaboration. Often within institutions, especially with ours, a multi-campus institution, we really were existing in silos. And suddenly we weren't. There was this sense of urgency and we saw leadership working with faculty, working with student affairs, working with our faculty developers, working with our IT operations uh, staff. And uh, again, just having a very rapid response. Uh, things that we had been quote unquote studying and piloting for a long time, like personal devices and secure testing solutions, all of a sudden they were implemented. <laughs> so um, it showed, I think, the value of, um, of, of certainly collaboration and having that sense of urgency to serve the students. Great. Thank you very much. And same question to you, Dr. Abdul Latif. I strongly believe that uh, what we are moving next toward definitely the blended learning and that will make a big impact in increasing the capacity of our students. The lesson learned is that we can deliver quality education system, blend it with a less cost for our students. It's about time. We don't need the footprint of our students to be five days a week in our campus. A couple of days a week, making sure that they pick up the hands-on skills, the competency that is needed. But on the other hand, we can open the capacity for the, uh, the theoretical lectures, that can be delivered online anytime, anywhere. It's an Uber-like education, and that will be available for our students at less cost, and we don't need to have this many classrooms in our campuses. We need to do more of labs, workshops, social activities, entrepreneurial activities, and less classrooms, and let the classroom be online available all the time for our students. Thank you very much, absolutely. Um, I would maybe throw a question because it's related and it's come in from one of, one of the uh, participants around the role of regulators in um, helping us work through and, and uh, you know, create the right guidelines and, and policies as well as uh, directives to allow us to operate in this. 
would anybody like to share uh, thoughts around how we can work more closely with regulatory bodies to help us work through this or, or if somebody's got some ideas around um, experiences of how this works better because at least in this part of the world um, online is still not as welcome as in other parts of the world. Professor Yusra, let me, let me make a comment here. Typically, honestly, no matter how innovative we are in our pedagogy, in our delivering, in our assessment, what pull us down are regulators. The accreditors are very traditional thinkers, unfortunately. And we have to debate with them all the time that we are still having good quality of education, that we don't need to do things, we don't need to, in terms of the credit hours, the qualification of faculties, number of time that these students have to spend. So it has always been deb debatable. And in the United Arab Emirates, at least we have an announcement was made if the, the online delivery of instructions of, of any specialized or any course specifically is less than 50%, that's not considered as a substantial change. So it is acceptable to be done within the, or the institution. If it's above 50%, we have to go back to the regulator to ensure that it's within the accreditation standards and we have to obtain that approach. That, that's my comment. So the trick is to keep it below 50 percent. Yes. <laughs> okay. And um, I'm going to try and take some questions that the the, pa the, uh, the participants have posed. And boy, we could have we could be answering questions all night. So I'm going to work through. I think some of them we've touched on. Others I'll try and pick up now. Um, maybe this one for you, Doctor uh, Professor Earl. Uh, there's a question here. What are the ingredients to avoid extinction of universities as we know them now? What do we need to do to avoid extinction, Dr. Earl? Difficult question. You might be seeing, you might not see me next year because I might be extinct. Uh, I think innovation, uh, so looking at what's out there and uh, running it through, don't, don't accept everything. Uh, it's... It, this is really an opportunity. So research-wise, you know, the obvious things would be uh, coming up with, uh, with research on COVID. Uh, but think of the things that we are looking at now, how we can redefine assessments, how we can redefine online education, what makes blended learning useful. Uh, I, I, to, uh, it, just to, add, to sort of add on to the point that Dr. Abdul Latif was making earlier, uh, you know, Singapore is very lucky in that our regulators, so to speak, are the Ministry of Education, and they're usually in line with us. Uh, the professional schools within our university have their own regulatory bodies, and those are difficult. But another, another very important uh, obstruction to innovation might well be the students and the parents themselves. So I was talking to Hong Kong universities. Uh, vice president a couple of weeks ago during the riots in hong kong they had you know they had to go online or they had to close down and then with COVID, they had to close down again and what happened then was the students are now demanding money back uh you know we are even getting i'm sure you're all facing the same thing our students are writing in asking us can we get a discount and we're telling them look it's costing us more to make it a good online assessment for you and online experience for you. We are investing in new tools and the, the, the materials that we're teaching, the brains that go behind this are just as good. But I, my prediction is it's not going to be the regulators that will kill us. It is actually the parents and the students who will say, why should I come to you when I can go to edX and get a micro degree from here? You know, and that's why I made that comment earlier, despite you know, knowing that I was taking up so much of your time, that one of the things that will make universities extinct is these online tools, because it might in fact make education extinct. Because now students will say, why should I come to your university and pay X hundred thousand dollars or you know, X uh, ten, tens of thousands of, of dollars when I can go on online and get a degree for less? But the question is, what does that offer you as opposed to a traditional university and its interaction with someone who is a leader in the field, interaction with peers, building communities? These are things that we offer, right? So thank you. I, I think that's an opportunity for evolution. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that, that's an absolutely very valid point, and it does actually lead me very beautifully into my next question, which is around... Um, 
universities are not there just to provide the knowledge. As you say, in, in today's world, the knowledge is available, Google, Edexcel, Coursera, you name it, I can go and get this knowledge. I don't need you to tell me this knowledge. But actually what we provide, I hope, is a platform for social maturity, I like to call it, so that the, particularly in our parts of the world where students are, have been quite sheltered and um, are, are not as exposed, um, the, the three or four years in university plus wherever possible the, the internship or the placement here really does provide an opportunity for growth and, and development, maturity. Um, how can we, and this is one of the questions that's come in, how can we, thinking of this return to campus in September stroke October, how can we recover some of that while maintaining the, the requirements of social distancing and the, you know, the needs of blended learning? How can we still ensure to avoid this, can I have my 20 and 25% discount? How can we ensure that we are keeping the students engaged in above above and beyond just the knowledge so professor tawana uh, given your background and, and the breadth of uh, of uh, you know student numbers and obviously the research aspect as well can you share your thoughts there with us prof tawana can you hear me Maybe he's fallen off the, I, I can't hear him. So can sorry, I- Sorry, I, Professor Yusra, I think we've lost Prof Tuana. We're trying to contact him. So okay. uh, just in the meantime, somebody else could take the question. Yeah, I was gonna say, Dr. Julie, would you mind sharing your thoughts on this? I'm sorry, no, I, forgot, I forgot the question. <laughs> was the that we lost him. <laughs> No, sorry, um, it's, it was about how can we compensate, if you like, the students for the, for the interaction and the social maturity element and the social interaction element of the student experience and the student journey um, whilst maintaining you know, the blended and the, and the, and the physical distancing and, and all those aspects that we have to observe come September, October. Certainly, and, and I, will, I think a lot of what my colleague from the UAE said earlier um, would apply uh, being strategic in our use of the campuses, not bringing students in just to listen to lectures, but their time on campus, they're actually, they're engaged, they're engaged with each other, they're engaged with employers, they're engaged in the community. Uh, certainly at our college, we focus on uh, core abilities, critical thinking, integrity, communication, diversity, uh, beyond uh, the theory that they receive in the classroom. So I think we're going to have sort of a fresh approach as we look at the fall and think about that exact question. How do we make this a value added experience over them just being at home, taking an online course? Fantastic, thank you, absolutely. I think um, every minute counts is going to be the mantra going forward, you know, and, and downtime in university is probably not a good thing now uh, because we do need to be engaging them in a different way, absolutely. Dr. Neriman, how am I doing for time? My, my watch says just before 6.30, 6.29. Will we yes. take some more questions? Or am I, I mean, right? if, if the panelists and the participants will be available for another five minutes, maybe we could extend for five, six minutes more, because there's a lot of questions coming in. Yes, I know. Is that well, okay? Professor Yusra, if you don't mind, let me also a little bit um, you know, add to what you just asking about and, on, and engaging our students when they come back to campus. One of the things we've been thinking about within the higher colleges of technology is not only about offering online classes. That's why we introduced the DigiCampus concept. The DigiCampus is where a lot of activities we can, uh, because the students have missed from campus, from coming physically to a campus, they can still get those kind of services online. For example, different type of uh, esports activities, e-competitions, counseling, whether it's career or social, uh, e-volunteering activities where students can contribute to some of the content, some of the graphics works that they can count uh, volunteering hours for it. Many activities that we find thousands of students really very, very, we are very happy because of the lockdown situation. If we go back and ask our students today, if you have the luxury to do an online attending classes, Without the, lockdown, without the lockdown, we will find many of the students are so happy to do that. But one thing we have to remember, 
maybe the, the under satisfaction of some of our students because we coupled the lockdown with the online act, uh, with the online instructions. So the students, for example, has the luxury to, start, to stay in a Starbucks and attend their class or go to their, with their friends and colleagues anytime, they will be so delighted to have that kind of opportunity rather than having to stay home. Coming back definitely during the fall, those activities will be recovered. And more and more, the way we see future campuses will shrink in size because we will reduce our classrooms and offer more labs, more workshops, more social activities, students to get with their peers, with their colleagues, do projects, for example, again, entrepreneurial uh, activities, start their companies, for example. That kind of a, activities will happen more in our campuses in the future. And we will find our campuses becoming less in size, more online for the, uh, for the theoretical and instructional part, more hands-on and competencies that, that again will bring their, uh, you know, the social part, it can be recovered by coming less to a campus, not necessarily every day the way you, they used to. Mm, very, very valid point. I, li I like this idea of a combination of lockdown and online. We don't know which one had most effect. I was having, um, just sharing my, our experiences here at Muscat University, I was having meetings, uh, I try to have meetings twice a year at least with uh, the students and I was having meetings with the undergraduate students as, and then separately with the postgraduate students and I was so proud of their reflective abilities when I asked them about their experiences of online. Uh, that What they were saying was it was very good but and so I said, what was the challenge? And they said, the biggest challenge was discipline. We need to learn to be more disciplined. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a sign of great maturity and understanding that they own their learning journey themselves. And that's a big shift, particularly in this part of the world. The fact that you own your own fate, you own that learning experience is a very, very important mental shift before anything. This is mine and I have to look after it. So I was very, very proud of, um, of them and of the responses. They were very, you know, way above their, their years, I have to say, so very proud of them. I'll take one more question because I do think we haven't covered it and then I, th I think we will have to wrap up. Um, we haven't covered this question about, um, we've talked a lot about students and, you know, how they've dealt with this. But there's a question here around uh, how staff have dealt with this challenge. Let's be honest, we've got, the students are digital citizens. They are citizens of this digital world. And some of our staff may not be citizens. They're, they're immigrants into this technical world. How can we as institutions ensure that, um, you know, th that we have enabled the staff to keep up with the students, not the other way around. How are we preparing staff for um, you know, the, the necessities of, it, it was a stopgap. March to June, July was a stopgap. You know, we, we did what we did and we've got it there. Now, going forward, how can we ensure that all staff, no one is left behind? Some people have been doing this for 25, 30 years in the same way. How can we make sure that they're moving into this new world? Anybody want to share some thoughts there? Earl, Dr. Earl, do you want to share your thoughts there? Uh, we, what we've done is to acknowledge that everyone has, everyone has value and we should not, uh, we should not drag people in. So, you know, if you have, if you have people who are very loath to do things online, we actually have, uh, you know, we actually have make it as easy for them to do these things as possible. We provide teaching assistance, etc. Uh, you know, I, I'll say that COVID has been amazing in that it is the great level. No matter what what you do, if you want to be relevant today, you have to go online. Look at Zoom. I mean, uh, when I first started doing these things, I hated the idea of appearing on a Zoom meeting. I felt I felt it was so unnatural. And then we started having these face-to-face -face and Zoom meetings. And in fact, that is now the basis for our new, our new normal. So, you know, we've just come out of lockdown and we are now arranging for people to come back to campus come August. But one of the things I'm mandating is that no matter, even if you have a face-to-face -face component, we're going to end up having some kind of online presence because uh, you can imagine how if you, don't, if you can't come to campus, 
and you're sick, you will still force yourself to come. And the last thing you want is to make someone who's sick come. I mean, as a doctor, I, I can tell you I've run clinics despite being horribly uh, ill from the flu. You know, I wear a mask and I still see my patients. And now the new thing is, no, I don't come. I get someone else to run the clinic for me because you, if you really are sick, you might pass it on. So one of the things we're doing is we're actually going to redesign our classes to have uh, cameras. Uh, we are hope we're training all our teachers to, to run face-to-face -face plus online classes with Zoom. Uh, we're, we're even planning to uh, look at all the spaces on campus and get our architecture and a sustainability uh, team to look at how we can make it as natural as possible. I mean, I used to complain that I, I traveled too much. I, I would be going from one meeting to another. And actually now, you know, with Zoom, you, you never need to travel again. But I'll tell you something, having been in lockdown for almost two months, I'm dying to travel. I mean, <laughs> even if it's just to go across the border to Malaysia, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I can't, I can't do that now. If I leave, I'm, I'm in quarantine for 14 days. I go out for two days. I come back, I'm in quarantine for 14 days again. <laughs> so all these things are, you know, we have, whether or not people are ready, we have to change. And I think that is the message that should be made clear to everyone. COVID is the great leveler. It has changed our lives. And, you know, after this, no doubt we'll forget that COVID ever happened and we'll just move on and go back to normal. But there will be another one sooner or later. You know, goodness knows which part of the world it comes from. And if we're not ready with the thing, we'll be again caught unawares and trying our best. So I, I really should shut up because I tend to always talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. L. Thank you. I mean, I think obviously I'm, I'm conscious of time and I know we have to wrap up. I've, you know, I'm, I've been trying to think of summarizing this. What, you know, there is so much. Dr. Nariman, I think you have to extend your sessions to about another 20, just the, the fallout of this, um, this session. There is so much that we have touched on. There's a lot more that we haven't touched on. Um, but I think for me, the, the big takeaway is that actually, as you say, Dr. Earl, it is the great leveler. Whether you're in the United States or whether you're in Singapore, whether you're in Oman, whether you're in uh, South Africa, China, the United Arab Emirates, we are all facing the same challenges. And actually what was very reassuring for me personally was irrespective of the size of the institution, we're a very small institution. Here we've got institutions that are very well established, hundreds of years old, with lots of students, lots of campuses. But you know what? We're all facing the same, the same challenges, but we also all can avail of the same opportunities. And this is where um, the strength of the institution, the resilience of the institution, the sustainability of the institution is really going to shine through. And, um, you know, we're going to really see some very different ways of working. I don't think we'll go extinct. I think we will um, survive in a different mode. We will be looking back on the days when we used to travel to conferences, you know, what was all that about? Why did I travel to the UK eight hours to do an, an hour speech at a conference? Where's the logic there, you know? So I think all that will, will change and for the better, it's much better. So um, there's a lot there, so many lessons learned, uh, so many lessons shared. Thank you all for your transparency, for your frankness, for your you know, open heartness. Um, thank you to the participants for the wonderful questions. I apologize, I haven't been able to pick up even maybe a quarter of them. There are lots of questions there. I hope that we've covered them somehow through the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Anariman and all colleagues at CLICS. Thank you, Elena, for, um, for facilitating and helping us arrive at such a, a wonderful session. Um, it's food for thought for all of us. Um, I will end by saying uh, stay safe, stay um, innovative, I think is, is, is the next stage. And um, just a reminder that um, the same time, so five o'clock, not now, five o'clock on uh, Monday the 29th is the second in the series of um, In Conversation with Clicks. And we'll be talking about planning the new normal. How has the uh, pandemic changed HE? So it's almost a continuation, hopefully, of today's discussion. So it is planning how we're going to look like in the next um, 
12 months, 18 months, the new normal, and how this has changed how we operate in HE. Um, I look forward to seeing you all there next week. I'll definitely be there. Thank you very much, Dr. Neriman and colleagues. Special thanks to the panelists and to the participants. Have a lovely evening and um, looking forward to collaborating with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone and have a pleasant evening. Thank you to our panelists, to our uh, uh, participants. And we see you next week, hopefully, inshallah, same time at five o'clock. Thank you. Ma Thank you. Thank you.